Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce Steve Sun, currently an associate professor of civil engineering and engineering mechanics at Columbia, where he's been since 2014. Steve's research interests run the gamut from computational geomechanics to computational poromechanics to multi scale modeling of fracture, damage, and plasticity. Steve has, I believe, won just about every award our community has to offer to young investigators, including Young Investigator Awards from the AFOSR and ARO, the NSF Career Award, the Leonardo da Vinci Award, and the Zinkevich Prize. This afternoon, he's going to tell us about some of his recent work utilizing graph theory and multi-scale mechanics. So Steve, it's all yours. Thank you, thank you, John, for the for the introduction. So let me start the presentation right now. So, uh, <clears throat> okay. So, um, so uh, thank you very much, and I want to thank, thank again the USACM for inviting me to, to give this uh, virtual seminar. Um, it's a great honor. So. Um, I want to start by uh, showing us the beautiful campus uh, of Columbia University. As you can see, um, um, yeah, yes, New York is a very uh, interesting and nice place. So today we will talk about something that uh, related to geography that I actually have some roots on the geography and that is graph theory. And how do we apply graph theory to mechanics problem? Uh, in the new framework that involves uh, machine learning. Um, before I get to the details, <clears throat> I would like to first acknowledge my students that actually do the work. Uh, as you can see the title, those are the major contributors of this talk. And notice that I did not include myself. So you can see <laughs> who's doing the hard work and who's uh, taking the credit here. But uh, so Nick, uh, Venus is actually the student that are working on the uh, on direct uh, weight graph, and Kun Wong is my former student that allow at North Salmos that are working on the direct graph. So the in the first half of this talk, I will focus on the on direct weight graph, and then the second part, I will focus on the direct graph and the applications. So um, the first question is that what is a graph? Um, and what are the uh, common types of graph that are used in mechanics? Okay, so the, uh, many people attribute uh, the starting of the graph theory in 90, uh, in uh, 1736, where Euler attempt to uh, visit uh, all um, the, uh, visiting the, the, the bridge uh, that are actually listed in the map without revisiting, revisiting any path. And he found out that in order to actually generate these tools, he need to define the nook set and the edge sets and connect it together. So uh, this is the beginning of the graph. And nowadays we see a lot of applications, both in machine learning and in classical mechanics problem. Um, and graph, one of the most important um, uses is to ind indicate relationships. So in the Wikipedia, you can see that the citation network, we can actually see the connection between which paper site which or which uh, article actually relate to each other. Social network is also another very common type of graph that are actually have a huge impact uh, on how we make predictions. Okay, so shown here is one of the example where we um, the, um, the graph can be used to predict the um, the, the political choice of individuals using the Facebook data. Um, it can be also to detect uh, fake news, okay, and applying in a chemistry problem. Uh, in the chemistry problem, there are molecules and atoms, and then they form a hierarchical structure. And of course, in the most classical sense, we are all engineer, and many of us are structure and civil engineer. Um, we can also consider uh, solving a trust system as a uh, solving a graph problem. Okay, so um, basically, in, in summary, graph is just a uh, nodes and edge uh, that are actually combined together to form a network. Okay, so in this talk, I will talk about two type of graph that are actually have uh, we, uh, applications in mechanics. We will talk about weight graph. And weight graph is designed, uh, is actually by definition, is a graph that contains nodes 
and contain edge, but either the nodes or edge can have some weight on it, and that weight can be anything about the attribute of the of the structure. Uh, for example, in the pole mechanics, we often uh, we often converge a void space into a network, and that network uh, actually we use a way to indicate the link between the between the two pole center, and that would actually constitute an array graph. And we can use the average graph to determine the tortuosity and connectivity of the void space. In solar mechanics, uh, in polycrystal problem, which we're going to focus in the first part of the talk, um, the, the implication is that we can actually generate representations of the structure by analyzing the, how does uh, the grand with different attributes are connect together. So in here, we have a polycrystal. In each polycrystal, we have multiple grand. In each grand can form a nox. And the nox can also have property. For example, the graph, uh, each grand can have different size, have different Euler angle orientations, can have different Young's modulus, and so does the edge. The edge can indicate whether the material is broken, intact, or actually what is the normal force that are applied to the material. So, uh, and also uh, another common way to actually uh, use the, uh, the weight graph is actually to store solutions. Let's say this is actually not our work, um, but, um, from, but from Christian. So what you see here is that uh, is the linear elasticity solutions. We can use the deformation map to link different solutions together. And as a result, we have a set of solutions that are linked by the relationship uh, uh, among different solutions. And also one classical way uh, to represent uh, the connectivity of the force is a force chain, which is also a weight graph. And in this case, the force chain basically will have the normal force as the weight. So what you see here is a data structure that are actually in the non-Euclidean space. For example, in a graph, you, we cannot take a divergence of gradient. Basically, it doesn't make sense. But each entity can have its own value. So the, the challenge here is that how do we find the right mathematical machinery to operate those graph or to, or to, or to using it to aim the mechanical predictions. Another type of graph that I will talk about is the one that with hierarchical relationships. For example, the family tree, literally. And actually this work and the, the use of direct graph can go back to at least in 2018, uh, uh, in 2008 where the, um, where uh, the Ortiz uh, Caltech group using the direct graph to model the, to, to actually re rematching uh, 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 Tachyhedral's uh, uh, domain. So basically the idea is that we can form a body and body can be composed of multiple volume and volume would naturally have surface, surface has edge, edge has point. And then and as a result, when we try to rematch, we can think about it as generate a new branch into the, into the, into the tree that are actually store the, the hierarchical information. So we separate from the geometry problem to the topological problem by introducing, the, by using it this way, we can actually modify the tree to get a new match. Uh, another thing that we are, we are actually also working on is actually the knowledge graph. Knowledge graph has been uh, recently uh, have a lot of uh, attractions in Google um, that actually represent different entity. But here, um, the, the goal we have here is to represent the constituted law as a knowledge graph. A lot of constituted law we can see here can be can be reconstituted as a knowledge graph that has uh, uh, that have used an input, for example, a string history to output a stress or relative displacement output attractions. The internal variable or the or the mechanics of the or the revolutions of the historical variable is related to how different physical quality are actually connect to each other. So another type of the direct graph that we have is a decision tree. So another application that I will talk about today is to design experiment. When we design experiment, we have a lot of different options to choose an experiment. For example, in a triaxial test, we can control how many confining pressure we have, what is the loading path, should we do unloading? Uh, if we do, uh, what kind of combination do we want? So if we consider all the possibility together, it constitutes a decision tree. 
And each experiment is a walk in this tree. And so the goal of designing the, the experiment is how do we actually, given a finite amount of resource, find out the finite number of the tree that can, uh, find, out, find out the finite number of the walk of the tree that can yield the best results for calibrations or for attack the model. Oh, another direct, uh, another usage of the directory is store time data. So unlike the spatial data, time is a one-way street. So the the future uh, uh, is affected by the past, but the past will not affect the future. So here is another example again from Michigan to show that we we can represent the relationship of different solutions and different time using a direct graph. In this case, that would be just with without any branch, that would be just different time step going from one, going from the earlier time to the later time. Okay, so this is the type of graph that we're going to talk about. And I would only highlight a few applications, one for weight graph and then one for uh, direct graph. Okay, so the first part of the talk is on the applications on the weight graph. Uh, this is actually mainly done by my student, uh, Nick Venus. So we actually confront a problem uh, when we have a recent uh, project on the moderate polycrystal or granular material. Okay, so shown here is two uh, REE, a uh, two pair of REE. One is crystal and other is granular material. <clears throat> so we have the following problem. If, um, if the A and B microstructure have exactly the identical void ratio, have the same uh, average orientations, have the same dislocation density, every, uh, have, the, have the same grand size distributions. However, if the microstructure are different, we would expect that the constitutive response are different. However, in this case, how do we write a material model if all the measurements we have are identical? Another thing is also the very common in soil mechanics or in geomechanics. We have the material with the same void ratio and same component pressure. But as you can see, the microstructure difference would lead to a very different response. Here, you can see that because uh, we have a very structured order of the particles, the, re the relationship with, would be relatively uh, isotropic, where this one would have a tendency to shear in a different direction, would have a different amount of uh, shear response. Okay, so if they are actually uh, statistically or volume averaging, uh, it, uh, or they're identical in a volume averaging sense, how do we describe one from the other? Okay, so this is actually one application where the graph will work. Because inherently, you can see in that in the different material, even though the average property are the same, the graph, connectivity graph are already different. So the goal is to see what, how can we use the graph without the burden of en en entering the entire graph as the input to write a constitutive law. If we look back into the development of the uh, plasticity or elasticity, we can actually consider the some of the progress of different constitutive model are related to introducing new descriptor. So we can see from J2 to Juker Prager, we introduced the mean pressure as the U as the functions of to uh, modify the U functions for critical state soil mechanics in geomechanics people uh, that are important for geomechanics. We introduce the uh, dependent of the void ratio and overall consolidated ratios in the hardening rules and the use. And uh, in the recent work, we introduced the fibric tensor to actually introduce the right evolving and isotropy. What we can think about this history that uh, one of the major role that are playing is the introductions of new descriptor that actually can help us to define the material and yet have something that are measurable. Okay, we can write a constitutive law by increasing the parameter or the number of internal variable, but oftentimes the real progress comes from the fact that we can identify the, something that we can measure and, and hence uh, constitute our relationships uh, or actually generate a hypothesis uh, on the relationship to make predictions. So from the mathematical point of view, this is equivalent to uh, gen uh, from the, uh, generating a direct multigraph to one exact direct graph. Okay, so 
So go back to the previous questions. How do we generate the descriptor is one of the tasks that we are facing. And what we are doing is a follow way. Okay, so I just want to show some of the example that uh, we're currently trying. Is that we would generate, uh, in order to understand how does the topology of, of the grand uh, arrangement or the grand property affecting the material, we would do, we would use a machine learning tools called graph convolutional neural network. And what we're actually doing is that we run a lot of FFT simulations for different microstructure that actually have a corresponding graph. And we try to process the graph with unsupervised learning to generate a low dimensional descriptor. And using this as an input to make, in addition to the string measure to predict a, a kinematic measurement or energy. So uh, mathematically, we can define it as, uh, uh, for example, the hemp of the energy or the elastic store energy of the material depends on the deformation, but also the initial polycrystal graph that define the connectivity. So you can see that unlike the, the common circuit supervised learning where each REE have its own uh, supervised machine learning, what we're trying to do here is that for all the fa same family of polycrystal, we can generate one constituted model that can deal with different microstructure. Each time we have a new microstructure, we can generate a new energy function that are different and distinguish uh, the REE from one uh, from from REE one to two that are otherwise unable to distinguish. You can see here this is the elastic energy functional uh, that are actually changed according to C one one and uh, and C two two. We've done the graph. The two relate the two behavior would look identical. These two would be completely indistinguishable. But with the graph as an input, we can see which one is which. And we can see what is the topological change influence the elastic predictions. Okay, so uh, our focus is on anisotropic material because inherently it's more interesting. It's also harder in some sense. And what we're actually trying to do here is that we will generate REE with, uh, we will generate 150 different REE. Each REE will suggest to 200 different uh, combinations of the string and then we constitute the data in the later work, we were also working on the generating the positivity response. But here, I just want to show the work on the elasticity. Now, if we have a graph, we can have a loss of nodes and we can have, have a loss of uh, 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 edge. And that also amount into a very big input compared to the classical circuit model, where we often use only a few scalar or tensor as an internal variable. So the idea is that we need to find a way to represent a graph without actually inputting the graph as an input. So this has been done in a lot of classification problem. Um, and, uh, and one of the, uh, the way to do it is the following. We will actually store the, the connectivity of the graph and feature in a different feature vector. And later on, we were using it for the convolutional neural network. So uh, this is a very tutorial type of example, we, uh, which is actually not used in practice, but you can actually see how we make the computations. The input for the convolutional neural network is a symmetric normalized graph Laplacian and the feature uh, matrix. And what we ha actually need to compute is actually the, the degree matrix, which indicate for a given uh, locations, how many neighbor does that grant has. So here, grand one have, have exactly one neighbor, grand two have two neighbor, and grand three have uh, three neighbor, et cetera, et cetera, one, two, three. And then we actually, uh, and then we have uh, defined another adjacency matrix, which indicate which neighbor, <coughs> which grand is which grand's neighbor. If, the, if their neighbor, if they are a neighbor relationship in the off diagonal term, you put a one there. And then we get the graph Laplacian. Okay, so but look at that in theory, you can use the graph Laplacian, but then uh, in some sense, in some case, you would want to get the symmetric normalizing one just to get a better uh, eigenvalue spectrum. Okay, so with this, then we can actually generate a supervised learning uh, example. Um, so in here, what we actually do is something called semi-supervised learning. Also at Sandia, there are some work that are using the convolutional neural network directly using the image to obtain the, to obtain the feature vector. The here major difference is that we start with the graph, 
and if you look at it, so in the graph here, I in order to prepare, in order to represent this structure, I only need a I only need a five by five matrix, okay, and I only need a feature vector that are five by whatever number of feature I want to store. So the dimension of the input is actually much smaller way before we do the convolutional neural network to further reduce the dimensions. But if you try to use a volume uh, voxel image, we may start with something in uh, much higher dimensions and then generate the feature vector that are equally small. So uh, what actually happened is that we were using these two as an input and then it passed through the graph convolutional layer to generate a low dimensional uh, feature vector. And that feature vector would be used as one of the input to in the surprise learning branch to actually change the store elastic energy. So this is called semi-supervised learning because this part is basically a dimensional reduction task that are conduct in an unsupervised manner. And this part in here, from here to here is just a classical supervised learning. I have a low dimensional uh, representations of the microstructure that are used as an additional input to help me change the energy functional so that for a given strain, I would have a stress measure. So the design is the following. So this part is an encoder. So if you're actually familiar with the, with the uh, machine learning literature, the encoder is one part of the auto encoder where we have an encoder and decoder. In an autoencoder, you input a, a, a graph, and what you want to do is to reduce the dimensions to the latent space, uh, and then we also want to see whether the decoder can generate the original image. If I can reduce the dimension into a small space and yet output the same or something that are very close to the original graph, then I obtain the low dimensional representations. Okay, so in graph, it also gives you different machinery than the classical core. Uh, Euclidean space for you to compact or reduce the dimensions. So I will show some examples. So, and this is actually not our work, but we been mainly uh, read the literature and then use the available source code to put it together. So if we start with a graph, we can actually have a convolutional neural network that uh, capture the feature. And then uh, what actually happened is that we can also compress the data by doing a uh, uh, core squaring for the graph. For uh, unlike the Euclidean space, what we actually can do is that we can do something called pooling. And here is one example. So initially, the graph has a lot of nodes and edge together. But if we can find out the microscopic structure, we can group a multiple nodes into a super nodes. So five, you can see that four nodes are grouped into one nodes these two are grouped into one nodes. And then we, after the pooling, we will get a much smaller structure that will present the larger structure. And we can repeat that process until we have a very small uh, data structure. And notice that if I know the mapping from here to here, from here to here, I did not lose any information. I just need to keep track of the mapping that help me map the small data to the original data. So ultimately what we actually do, and then after that, we generate a classification to actually group different type of feature together and then that would give us a low dimensional structure. Okay, so um, this is actually how we actually compress the data. In the surprising uh, uh, branch, I think that a lot of us are very familiar with it. We give the input and output as the training data and we actually change the way to actually adjust the behavior. But what we actually found out is that um, if you actually use the string as the input, and then output the stress. A lot of time, the stress lost some desired property. And also the derivative of the stress is often oscillating and being non and the energy functional could be non-convex. So this is one of the problems that uh, we have been uh, working on for a while. And we find we seem to find some promising lead here is that when we actually change the when we actually want to generate a constituted law, instead of uh, outputting the stress, I would output only the energy. However, I would also use the first derivative of the energy, in this case, the stress, stress measure as the in additional input for the loose functions, for to help me adjust the voice. And then I can also use the second derivative, which is actually the stiffness uh, components to help me actually recognizing the data. 
So notice that in this incident, I would not need more data. I just take advantage of more data that I already have. For each time step, I collect the, the energy, the stress, and the stiffness uh, tensor, and then I use utilize all of them in the training. So we can see the comparison. So this is the classical L2 uh, loss function. If you change the strain stress pair, this is, uh, this is a result we can get, okay? So we can see that uh, it actually generates a good learning rate, except that uh, it's not as good as the H2. You see that this is 10 to 8 order, minus 8, and this is 10 to minus 6. But the earlier is not only better for the L2. If in the, for the H2, the higher order uh, loose function training, we actually find that even if you measure it in the L2 norm, uh, even if you optimize it, even if you measure the performance using the L2 norm, the, L, the H2 norm minimization yield a better L2 norm for the material, for the material predictions. So uh, this is actually um, uh, quite encouraging. So we can get uh, basically two order more accurate results by just uh, changing a little bit of the training. And we can also see the response. You see, this is actually uh, just a very simple energy functional as a test problem. We can see that in the H1, um, the, the, not only the energy functional look alike, but then the stress are actually matching much better than the L2 training. Okay. And for the L2, you, uh, for the H2, you also see more desirable result, and that is the less oscillation of the uh, of the coefficients of the second derivative of the energy functional, which is which is actually the the tangential stiffness matrix. Now, uh, this is actually on isotropic material as a test. But if we go back to the to the polycrystal data, we can also start to see the trend here. In general, so what we see here is the calibration uh, calibrate RVE and unseen RVE. We can seeing that. Um, in general, the calibrate the, the bind testing is doing not as good as the calibration data, which is expect. But you can also see that by increasing different amount of the nodal informations on the on on the on the feature vector, we can actually improve the prediction by moving the earlier bar from the right hand side to the left hand side. So in the H, uh, in the M1 scheme. The, the, the ray graph are actually using only the, uh, the crystal volume as the way of the graph. So the, this, is only, uh, this is only a single vector that are put into the, that are put in the convolutional. And what we get is the blue curve, okay? And then what we actually see is that um, the bind testing and the training are actually very similar. Uh, when we actually introduce the Euler angle of the relative orientation of the grand, and those grand are actually anisotropic. We can see in that the, the graph start to shift into the left hand side, which indicate the, uh, the reductions on the on the on the uh, on the Euler. And what we actually also find out is that in general, the to get the principal values of the of the stress measure correct is much easier than the finding out the right directions. And this is something that we are still working on, on how to improve the directions. But no matter how we write, we find out that the directions are usually the harder part to predict. And we can also see that in principle, we can add a lot of secondary attributes uh, uh, that, are, that are more or less important for each grant to make a better predictions. But the, but the benefits start to diminish. So that would give us uh, a sense of what kind of a single grand parameter that are important for the polycrystal. We also did uh, more tests that are actually compare the FFT simulations that are actually not used in the training and testing and validation, validations on the performance for the elasticity part. And uh, we also did additional tests. This is the uh, a graph test in the, in the sense that if I change the order of the nodes, if I change the name of the nodes, whether I get the same result. And you can see in that um, the order of the grand doesn't matter. And then we also check the convexity. Now, one remark we have here is the difficulty on, uh, on expressing the, the tensor term and, and uh, what is the best way to actually write the objective functions that can get the most benefit of the tensor property. And uh, what we actually find it helpful is the spectral decompositions. Now you have a tensor, 
we change the or we change the eigenvalues by uh, actually try to match the eigenvalue as much as we can. But the principal directions can be represented in multiple different ways. So if you take out the principal directions, we have something in the SO3 group, the, sp the special or formal group. So how do we compare two uh, rotations that are actually look dif that are different? Com Surgery component by component. So that one, I think we know, all know that it's not going to work. But, uh, but what we actually found out is that um, what, how do we measure the, the how do we how do we measure the difference between two rotations actually matter or, or make a lot of difference on the predictions of the accuracy of the principal direction predictions? So shown here is two results for one single uh, for one grand one single grand uh, crystal plasticity for FCC. So you can see that if we do a component based training, okay, we can get the eigenvalue really uh, really accurate. But then it cannot capture the sudden uh, activation of a slip system, which lead to the spin of the uh, of the of the um, principal directions. If we do it in the Lie algebra, it tends to do much better. Okay. Another extension we try to do is to generate the homogenization of crystal properties. So this require a very careful data search. Again, uh, typically either we do it in experiment or doing it in, uh, in RV simulations. The simulations and the tests are both expensive. So what we actually did here is that we would first find the free yielding point in the, in the piping and we are, we are assuming that the, the sensitivity to the, to the hydrostatic stress is actually not that much. So we can actually basically do anything in, a, we can actually assuming that the, the shape doesn't change according to the hydrostatic plane. And what we actually try to see is to visit every corner and see what happened, uh, what happened, what, what is the shape of the, of the use surface. And I'm surprised that we find something very close to a uh, Cheska uh, yield function for the polycrystal structure. And we still want to know why um, but this is actually the general result. So as you can see, this is an isotropic. So when we rotate the, the, the crystal orientation, we get a different use stress. And what we're actually trying to do right now is to connect what is the, what kind of, how does the revolutions of the encode feature vector affect the shape of the yield function for given orientations. So if it's success, then we can actually capture a family of the polycrystal structure and understand how does the change of the graph connectivity affect the yield functions. And from that, then we can actually also work on the hardening. So um, the second part of the talk, I think I'm a little bit slow, so I would actually go a little bit faster. Uh, as usual, um, typically I just, uh, I just lost a sense of time sometime when I give the talk, but uh, but here it is. Another type is a direct graph. Okay, so direct graph uh, actually, as we mentioned before, uh, will present some kind of hierarchical relationships. So when you write a constitutive law, your input can be considered the roots of the direct graph and your output is the tree. So what happened in between is actually something that can be done, can be actually represented by a direct graph. Uh, one way to think about modeling is that in, when, you, when we write a model, we consider all the possibility to write something that lead to a, a direct multigraph. And when we say we write a model, some, sometimes it's equivalent to find, making the decision to say that I believe this uh, causal relationship is actually what driving the constitutive response. In here, what the machine is predict is the relations, how does the porosity uh, uh, fibric tensor and then the geometrical measure affect the, the traction separation law. Okay, so um, this can be done um, by constitute the, the more constitutive modeling as a game of connecting uh, the roots to the tree. Okay, so when we write a constitutive law, we actually, well, if we idealize it as a process to connect the input to the output, we can actually use the AI to actually help us find out what is the right connectivity that lead to the graph, uh, that lead to the predictions. And we can actually connect them, them by using a new network of mathematical expressions. And we have tried both. And then what we actually happen is that in each graph, we would actually generate a model. 
And what we are actually doing is to use the reinforcement learning to help us continue improve the predictions of the model. So shown here is actually the alpha goals at the top. You can see again that at the beginning, the alpha goal doesn't make very good predictions. As time goes by, it goes better and better. The reason is the following. In each time we end the game, it's either win or lose. But what actually happened is that we can use the neural network to predict the earlier policy values that actually govern how does the, the AI pay the chess. The same for the writing the consultative model. If you think about it as a decision making process, uh, paying the alpha goal and writing the consultative model mathematically, they are equivalent to each other. We are making the decision to think about how does different quality are related to each other and what is the mathematical relationship among them so that I can connect it in the proper way. So here in the meta modeling game, I'm not making the piece move, but I'm trying to figure about what is the mapping, the map from the in, from one nodes to the other. And uh, we, we use the reinforcement learning to actually find out what is the relative benefit of connecting it, uh, the different variable in one way or the other, and update the Q table by actually repeat try and error. So this is actually what happened. So we have all the physical measurement that we can measure and that constitute the initial game. And actually all the possible way to connect it would become the direct multigraph. And the model, the job of the AI is to generate exactly one direct graph that actually make the best predictions. So the training, uh, I won't talk too much about the details for the sake of time, but you can see a real test uh, that I actually published before. So what the AI did is that um, it, it would actually assign initially a random values on making a, a predictions on the Q value. It would, it would move according to the best Q value values. So uh, whatever that the AI consider the best would have the maximum Q value award. And then once you connect together, the, it would actually subject it to the environment, which is the uh, uh, benchmark uh, testing data. And that uh, depends on the L2 norm, it will generate an uh, update on the key values to tell us a more accurate picture about the relative benefit of one modeling technique to the other. So we can see here, so we have 75 episodes, which means that we write, uh, we write 75 different constitutive law, uh, not us, but from, from the AI automatically generate. And each time uh, it turned to generate a better response. Okay, and at the end of it, then we can see that just after 75, the checks and separation should not predict a pretty good results. And this is actually also something that uh, we can see in that uh, initially the model is actually exploring different techniques to write a model. And eventually we, we cool down the temperature to yield a converged uh, response. Okay, so, but here um, we also extend this game not for modeling, but for design experiment. And we also introduce multiple payer. The goal is actually sort of inspiring from uh, one of the PI meetings. So um, if we have experimental law, if the model is fixed, but we have one model trying to calibrate the model, but we have another model trying to make the model make uh, look as bad as possible. It will motivate them to generate a different type of uh, data, design a different type of experiment. And then what actually happening is that we can introduce an AI environment so that the two more, two experimentalists can compete against each other to see who we not. So the, the so in this case, the decision is represented by a decision tree. And uh, in each time, in each game uh, um, rotations, the the protagonists and the advisory uh, agents are actually each generate a different design of the test and that is run by RVE or physical experiment and then we and then we compare the results using it for calibrations and the Q, deep Q learning basically is, is identical we try to we in each time step the, the experimentalists generate one experimental design running it in the RVE or physical experiment and the advisor also do the same and then they calibrate and then test the data and once we did that, we back populate the key value so that they can improve their art of designing the experiment. This can be done in a parallel fashion. So we can see here, 
uh, we, we actually starting the game and then each of them design the test and then run the test and then calibrate it. And we can see the result here for, for the Jupyter Proctor. So the data is the DEM. So they are equipped with the DEM solver to run a arbitrary DEM. This could be a triaxial compaction test, triaxial extension test. The goal of the, of the first agent is to make the model calibrate as good as possible. The second agent is to make it look as worse uh, in the worst possible way. And through the collaboration, each time they share the data with each other so that they can learn, so that uh, they can learn from each other to make the game even better. At the end of it, we will reach the Nash equilibrium and then there's no more pawn to run more tests and then the game will automatically stop. So in the exploration way, they would try different combinations of the strat uh, of the loading tasks. You can see that the agent trying some uh, loading and loading uh, almost randomly. But at the end of the game, you can see that they, the, the both, both agents start to recognize the weakness and the strength of the model. So in the Jupyter Parker, it's actually quite expected, the results. We see the Jupyter Parker do really well on the mono, uh, monotonic loading, but it's not doing that well on the, on the history that I have a lot of unloading and a combination of kinematic or rotational hardening. And we can see the result here. Eventually, you can, uh, we can actually see the, the, the tendency. We can also compare a more complex model that do better in the DEM. This is actually the mensali Devalius model that have better uh, hardening mechanism. You can see the performance that are actually different. So again, the defense is, uh, is done by the first agent trying to find out what kind of data the model have a string on. And, uh, and the attack is actually focused on finding what is a weakness. And we also compare with our checksum separation law, and we can see different tendency here. So this one in the works, in each, in, at the beginning, you can see that it successfully attacked the model, which means that this is actually reasonable because at the beginning, the, the first agent doesn't know what kind of data that could lead to a very robust results. But as the game progress, uh, both of them are actually closer and closer to reach the steady state. We can see that the final outcome is what matter. You can see in this case, the machine learning traction separation law can generate very good uh, predictions. And when they share the same result, in the worst case, this is already the worst case, um, the, the adversarial attack can generate. Versus compared to this uh, earlier case, we can see that um, the attack is more successful as indicated by the score. So hey, Steve, this, um, Steve, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I think uh, if you don't mind, if you can wrap it up um, because we do have several people that have started to um, enter some questions into, into the talk. Okay, so I, I will stop. So uh, I will stop in, uh, in a few, uh, maybe in two more slides. So, um, so this is actually the heat map of the, de of the decision tree. You can see that uh, for the model one that are in charge of the calibrate, it start to actually figure out initially, it just guess everywhere is good. Eventually it find out the type of data it need to best calibrate a given model. And the same for the attack, it find out what is a weakness and just stay there. Okay, so, and again, this is not limited to uh, machine learning constituted law. It also works for any constituted law that you would want to test. So we can potentially this algorithm can tell you the weakness and the strength of a given model in the decision tree. So some future work we are also working on, uh, as uh, we mentioned at the beginning, our word is in geomechanics. So we also want to see uh, what kind of the, if the graph is evolved with time, how do we best representing it so that we can generate the latent space for the changing of the graph. And another thing is the causal discovery. Uh, this also a very popular topic, both in uh, philosophy and computer science. Uh, this is in collaboration with our colleagues from Johns Hopkins. How do we actually find out what is the causal relationship about variable? So I will just uh, stop here. So, but what I want to summarize is that uh, we generate a direct ray graph and then the direct graph these two category of graph have its own unique applications. And I hope that I convince you that for some of the problem, it could be, uh, could be helpful for us as a new tools to solve some of the old problem in solar mechanics.
So this is the relative, uh, this is actually the reference that we have. And I want to conclude by um, first uh, thanking uh, the sponsor of my research um, and also my student that actually worked very hard to making it happen. And I want to thank all the audience for patiently listening to me uh, for, uh, for, the, for all the time. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, so for those of you who have questions that have been waiting patiently, if you want to um, type them into the chat space now, you can. Uh, in the meantime, I'll, I'll start with those that have been posed from the beginning. Um, so I'll just ask the staff if they could unmute uh, Naveed uh, Shervani Tabar. And I apologize, Naveed, in advance um, for probably mispronouncing your name there. But I'll just read Naveed's first uh, question. Uh, he says, when coarsening your graphs, is there any physical coarsening objective for the coarsening of the, your graphs, or is it solely based on spectral scores of the graph? Yeah, I think that um, this is one of the reasons we use the semi-supervised learning. Um, if you actually look at the branch, ultimately it's subject to the same loss function, so that um, you, so it, it actually turned to generate the latent space that actually improved the predictions of the supervised learning branch. If we completely cut it off as a, as a two-step process, we may actually generate some low dimensional representations, but that representation may not directly benefit the, the predictions. So, so this is actually why we have to uh, co combine it together is this generate some kind of bias so that we can generate the, the low dimensional representations. Thanks, Steve. Naveed, did you want to follow up with your additional questions? Uh, yeah, so uh, thanks for the interesting talk, uh, first of all. And so my second question was, uh, you mentioned that uh, normalizing graphs, that basically normalizing Laplacian of the graphs gives a better eigenvalue structure. I was wondering from what aspect basically you're saying that what basically benefit does it have would it have yeah i mean for the example that i show it may not be so obvious because everything is uh, more or less the same but we, we may have other case where you have a more extreme uh, connectivity uh, or so for example in social network that could happen so in our problem, we always have one to four neighborhood. Maybe it is not that important. But, right. but and, the, okay. and Naveed, I see you had one last question perhaps that you want to ask. Yeah, so my last question was, um, so I actually wanted to follow up with the first question. One oh, quick note that, ahead. Sure. Uh, yeah, if we have time. So uh, I, my main question basically, when you group two nodes together, uh, what's your criteria for, uh, I didn't understand basically based on your answer, what's your criteria for grouping nodes when you do coarsening in each step? When you try to group two nodes, um, yeah, I mean, this is done in the, in the convolutional neural network. Uh, after getting the convolutional neural network, uh, we try to do the pooling. Um, uh, I think that in the training of the neural network, what you want to try is to find out the low dimensional representation in the encoder so that if you apply the decoder, you get back the original structure. That may be the only, that would be the only criteria. Okay, so you don't implement some sort of physical constraints on how to group these, like based on your specific problem. I haven't, but I can see, totally see why in some case that could be beneficial. So for example, okay. physically, there are things that are assembled together. Or another thing that we consider is the following. If you have a single grant, the single grant inside the direct graph, you can also form a direct graph to represent how many edge you have, what is the service area, uh, this kind of stuff. So you, you, in that sense, you have another hierarchical structure. We, we can think about how to customize this to leverage the structure. So, so to answer your question, I think that is actually possible. It depends on the problem yeah. and the type of material. Uh, for example, I can think maybe metal material or architect material, they may have some inherent uh, leverage if you think about how to represent the data better, that that could be something that uh, worth to think about. But right now we do yeah. not do anything. We just try to see whether, as it, it, whether we can actually generate the representation well. 
Thank you very much. And lastly, what are the input and latent dimensions basically for your network? Latent space dimension and input. You mean the input of the nodes? Uh, no, like the whole graph. What's the dimensionality of the uh, graph that you input the data? And what's the dimensionality of the latent space in your work? So the unsupervised learning for other application can go for very large graph. We haven't tried something really large, but uh, we tried something ranging from maybe 50 grand to a couple thousand per particle. Uh, so, so, but I think that uh, we can potentially try way more if we actually, because what we are doing, base, doing basically the spectral methods. So uh, ultimately, uh, yeah, ultimately uh, we can actually effectively uh, try, I think in, in general, the size of our problem compared to the social network is much smaller. Or hmm. uh, let's put it that way, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you, you. Naveed. So uh, the next question I'll read um, from Hojat. Uh, well, um, the um, staff can unmute him or her. Uh, so the, it reads, um, in the real world, apart from the microstructure, the macroscopic response could be the same. How is that considered in your approach? In other words, for different microstructure, we might have the same macroscopic response. So if you have the same microscopic uh, response, um, I mean, I, I don't understand, maybe I need to, I don't need to understand it. If you have the same different, so what we are trying to do is to find a handle so that we have a unique one-to-one uh, -one mapping. But what, what actually could happen in the, the case where, you, I mean, you can certainly have different microstructure to have same response. But in that case, I was still thinking that you may want, our, uh, we still need to figure out why they yield to the same response. So if we see that, I will actually certainly see how can we train two different graphs and get come up with the same microscopic response. So, but, uh, but uh, yeah, I need to, yeah. So that would be my, that would be my uh, understanding. So Hojad, I see that you have a you have a question there that I skipped over as well. I didn't know if you wanted to ask that now. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk, Dr. Sa. Uh, I had uh, another question. Uh, how much would be the uh, computational cost uh, for a real world problem if you were to uh, run this code uh, on, on that case? So I, I was saying that one of the major motivation for us to switch from the from the uh, Euclidean, uh, from the classical convolutional neural network to the graph is a course. You can see that if I have a voxel image, 1,000 by 1,000 by 1,000, and then it's a color map, I'm looking at 1 billion of voxel that I have to manipulate. I, I have to generate the feature vector. In the graph, I start with something much smaller. You, you see, see what I mean? <laughs> In the graph, I have two sets. Okay, not one node set and one edge set and have some weight, but then you can, we can, you can see in that the dimensions already reduced before we do the convolutions. Okay. Um, so, but uh, to answer your questions, I think it depends on the computer. Um, we have uh, HPC, but uh, we never do anything beyond the two nodes. So I think it's pretty accessible to most uh, researchers. Thank you, thanks. Thank you, Ojet. Uh, so the next question we have is from Sadiq uh, Kidwai. So if we can unmute uh, Sadiq. So Sadiq is asking if you can shed some light on the uniqueness, stability, and convergence characteristics of these schemes. Uh, okay. <laughs> this seems to be a difficult question to answer, but um, yeah, uh, I think one of the reason that we try to do the H1 training is, is actually to maintain the complexity. And through the complexity, we can actually get some light like, property uh, uh, about, uh, about uh, uh, getting a unique and stable solutions. Uh, I, uh, um, as, as for the general case, I think it depends on the uh, uniqueness and stability of what prediction. So I can, I can say it for the elasticity response. Uh, I was saying that uh, Predicting a hyper-elasticity model is a mathematically easier task because you know what you sign up to and you have the geometry that you can pay with and to ensure and, and the complexity basically can help you uh, get uh, uh, the uniqueness and stability because you have the length scale. Um, for the back box, uh, mapping is actually harder to tell. Uh, I was saying that if you're just thinking from the strength space to get the stress, we may get, we may certainly get the stress, but it's hard to check uh, whether we get the good results. 
Another thing that could be tried is that if you generate, we can try rather you see the one uh, one to one mapping is that if we can do one supervised learning on using the string and get the stress and then do another training from the stress to the string and see whether they yield similar behavior. Uh, that is more like an ad hoc approach. Um, but I, I, my, my favorite is actually using the energy because that, that simply give you more. And then for the impressive uh, mathematical model, you really need the tangent to have some smoothness and then the, and then the higher order training can actually give us the smoothness that we need to advance the, the code. If you have a very good uh, stress string response, but they are kind of bumpy, then the tangent would be very unstable. I don't know whether I answered that question well, but uh, from the practical purpose, I think this is a necessary condition. Sadiq, did you have a follow-up or was that? No, uh, no, no, John, uh, I, I'm, I'm satisfied for now, but certainly, okay. you know, with any complex scheme and method, I think it'd be good to have some sort of confidence level, you know, developing. And I guess uh, Wai Ching and Steve would write a paper in CMNAME very soon on these, uh, these issues too. <laughs> Thanks, Sadiq. Uh, so maybe the last uh, question, uh, Susanta Ghosh um, has a question. Uh, it reads, what are the criteria for the edges for the polycrystalline material? Is it only the interface area or their angle as well? Oh, yeah, right now uh, I assign an edge whenever they're in contact. So the way that there is no weight on the edge. But this is one of the interesting thing about the edge because imagine that when we propagate a grand, a grand boundary factor, for example, or, or something like that. We can certainly have a graph that are both node weight and edge weight, and the, and the edge weight can represent some uh, microstructure behavior. On top of that, I was thinking that adding the surface area it seems to be a good no-brainer to, to start. But we can also include other uh, aperture, uh, um, uh, other feature that could be potentially beneficial. For example, roughness, okay, uh, or friction angle. So, um, but then right now we haven't tried anything on the both the no, no edge range graph, but this is something we are very interested to do in the future. Thank you. So thank you. And so maybe Shuzanta, did you have a follow-up or is that okay? No, that's a good one. Thank you. So we just did have one last question. Uh, so Shashank um, um, Path uh, Rutkar um, has a question. Shashank, would you like to go ahead? Let's see if I can unmute. Can one of the staff unmute Shashank? Uh, yeah. Go can ahead. You hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, yeah. So on slide 13, you had a, a diagram or schematic of your framework. Uh, I just had a doubt regarding that. So once you obtained a normalized graph Laplacian and feature matrix, uh, and then you ma map it to feature vector, uh, that is done through a plain CNN, right? No, it's done for a graph convolutional neural network, not not the uh, not the classical CNN. Okay, and uh, then again, you incorporate deformation tensor uh, with that with the output of first network to obtain energy functional. Uh, that is mapped through what network? So so right now, what we did the, the so the the graph that you input is only the initial um undeformed configurations uh, graph that are actually coming from the undeformed configurations. It's not evolving right now. So what we try to do is to, to, we try to determine the relationship between the initial configuration. How does the initial configurations affect how the energy function will look like in the stress space, or sorry, in the, in the, in the string space? Okay, so you, you see what I mean? We are not trying, we are not yet able to doing it by actually capturing the revolutions of the, of the graph yet, uh, but that may be something that we are thinking about in the future. Um, also, those things that capture the revolution of the graph uh, is called inductive uh, graph, if I understand correctly, but I'm, I'm not quite there yet, so hopefully in the future we can try. But if you try to do it in time history, you have even more rich information. For example, what is the stress contour? Should I do a POD on the stress contour to generate some descriptor on the on the single grand level of problem? So, so it, it opened another box of uh, opportunity, but then we need to think about what is the best way to attack that problem. But uh, this is actually definitely our next step. Okay, okay. Thank you, um, thank, thank you. you. And uh, thank you, Steve, again, for, for a great talk and your availability for the Q&A. 
Uh, I'm sorry we have to end this. Uh, I'm sure there are many more questions and I would just encourage those of you that didn't get a chance to ask Steve a uh, question today uh, to reach out to him by email. Uh, I think you know, all know where, where to find him and I'm sure he'll be happy to, to answer your questions. Uh, and as a reminder, we'll, we'll have another seminar uh, next week. So we just encourage you to look out for that announcement and to register for the talk if it's, uh, if it's a topic of interest. Uh, thank you all very much for, for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, John. Thank you. Appreciate it.